Welcome to Worship with Midland Online this week. We are beginning this season of Lent, this time of preparation, a time of reflection and readying ourselves for the big celebration, the resurrected Savior who brings life for us all in Jesus Christ on Easter. So during these 40 days leading up, we have a little bit of a different setting here, something very plain and something very simple pulling away things that maybe are distracting just for the purpose of worship during this time to really be able to reflect, to look at ourselves during this time. And so we're really so glad you're able to join us as we get started. Reminder, we have great stuff for kids during this time as well, a great series going on. Check out the description right below here. Click those links and open it up for your children on another device or on another TV in your house. Give them a chance to worship while you worship as we begin this season of Lent. Just to let you know kind of how it'll go this week, we're going to have an opportunity for some music, a special time of prayer, and then I'll have a sermon for us to reflect on as we begin looking at the last day in Jesus' life before He is crucified. And so I hope you enjoy this time as we gather together online for worship.
Let us pray. Holy God, we come into this season of Lent as a people well aware that we stand in need. God, we can't make it happen on our own. And yet, as we read through the stories of Scripture and as we reflect back on our lives, we get to see a God who has been active and a God who continues to be active, bringing life for us all. God, as we begin this season of Lent, this time of preparation, We pray, God, that you take this time and use it to ready our hearts, to once again celebrate a risen Savior, to have our eyes open to see the fullness of life that's made possible through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that we become a people more and more aware of who we are, who you have created us to be, the fallen nature that God is a part of life for all of us as we live in a broken world, and yet also the hope that we cling to is we see you at work in the here and now and hold tight to your promises to see your kingdom come. It's as your people that we join together in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, the first Sunday in the season of Lent got it started on Ash Wednesday. Just uh, earlier this week, a time where we came together for a time of worship, a time of reflection, of recognizing the brokenness in our world, the sin that's present in our lives and our need for a Savior. And as we begin this season of Lent, you know, she's 40 days of really a time of self-denial, of reflection, of remembering and preparing for the resurrection and for the life. And I thought, you know, maybe for us, since this season is set in such a way for us to be able to reflect and see, maybe it's really important to take a moment to really kind of simplify things down and have an opportunity to focus. And again, that's the reason for a much simple setup uh, during this season of Lent. We're also going to take a look at the Gospel of John, the last uh, day of Jesus' life here before he is crucified. And as we look through it, we find in the Gospel of John that there is a lot said by Jesus in those times. And so there's a lot for us to pull from it in that Gospel. One of the crazy things that I found is that if you go and you look at uh, kind of the, the top Bible verses that are searched on the internet, that are published, there's some uh, a guy who kind of tracks it. And again, you can take it for what it is. Maybe he doesn't track it right, and this isn't exactly right on. But I thought it was pretty interesting to see that as I went through to find uh, how it's categorized as the most popular, most quoted, most cited online Bible verses, three of them, the top three, in fact, come from the Gospel of John. And you've probably heard of these. You probably know them. The third was John 14, 6. You know how that one goes? Where Jesus says, For I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes through the Father except through me. Ever heard that one before? That was number three. Number two was John 1, 1, chapter 1, verse 1, which maybe you know that one too. It starts kind of like the beginning of the Bible, right? In Genesis 1, where it says, In the beginning, but a little bit different after that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. A pretty strong introduction to this understanding of Jesus, right? Second most. Now, what do you think the number one is? Come on. Come on. You guessed it. Come on. The number one Bible verse that is found, searched, cited online, according to this website, was... John 3, 16, that's right. And you can say that with me, right? For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's right. And a lot of us know that one. John three sixteen, the top three verses 
searched online all come from the Gospel of John. But here's the deal. Whenever you talk with somebody about the Gospel of John, have you ever had someone, maybe you were trying to find something to read, or maybe when you were new to the faith, whether that was as you were younger, here recently, you kind of were stepping into this whole Christian faith idea, and you said, hey, what do I need to read? And has somebody told you, read the Gospel of John? I think that's horrible advice. Just so you know, um, if you've told somebody that, take it back. Don't ever say it again, because this has got to be one of the most complex parts of the Bible anywhere is the Gospel of John. Now, it is wonderful, and I love it, and obviously people around the world all over online love the Gospel of John as well, because it's the top-sided verses, right? As we just said, the top three all come from the Gospel of John. But it's not an easy, simple read, and if you think it is, Maybe you need to take a chance to step back and read it again because it's some thick material. And as I was looking at it, thinking about it, I'm going, man, I want to simplify things down and have a chance to focus during this season of Lent. And yet then I'm picking the Gospel of John beginning in chapter 13 as Jesus gathers with his disciple for that last dinner together before he's arrested as what I want to focus on. And here's what I was thinking. When you begin to look at it, and it's Jesus' teaching to take place. And what I want us to kind of take an opportunity to do, because life is complicated, is it not? Much like the Gospel of John, I would like to argue, is a pretty complex part of the Bible. I want to take these moments of looking at something that is rather complex and see if we can't in some way find a way to read into Jesus' words that maybe can simplify the power of what Jesus has said and done and left for us now to grow into as people. So maybe the way to say it is simplicity in the complexity. Simplicity in the complexity. An opportunity much like how our life is, is it not? How many of y'all know that life is just really complex and it gets very, very complicated and we just long for an ability in the midst of life to find simplicity? So I hope that our time here in the Gospel of John over these upcoming weeks will give us a chance maybe to look at our lives and to see if there's not something going on in a way for us to begin to think about in the mix of this complexity that is our life, that maybe we can find simplicity, just like in the complexity of the Gospel of John, to find some simplicity in the message Jesus has for us. So you down with this? Here we go. We'll give it a shot. We're going to take these six weeks leading up to Easter to really look at these last uh, hours of Jesus' life and these teachings that take place and see what we can take away. As I got to thinking to get it all started, you know, I was going through the questions in my head that I kind of look at and I said, why is it that we can have a good response in mind as people begin to talk, tell us things, we see things happening, and yet we can miss the mark? As people are talking to us, telling us stories, updating us on things going on, we can hear things, but why is it that we can have a good response in our mind, and yet this response in our mind and our actions that follow somehow miss the mark completely to what is being said to us? Have you ever been there before and seen this happen? Uh, one of the ways that I, I kind of think of this is if you've ever seen uh, Frozen, which came out, what, like eight or nine years ago now, so you better have seen it now. Popular, very popular Disney movie. My kids love it. We quote it all the time. We can sing most all the songs from both of them now. Um, but this film has, uh, in the first Frozen, has this scene that takes place uh, where you got Kristoff, who is the guy who's all about you know making the snow and delivering it in there, and he, he's coming into town, and this whole like frozen thing is really ruining business for him. Um, but he runs into Anna, you know the you know, Elsa's sister, and she demands that he take her out to find her sister. And as they're traveling around in uh, his very nice sleigh, I guess you could call it, that's what I like to call it, as they're traveling around in this, they begin to just talk like we all do when we're traveling and have nothing else to do with someone. And as they're telling the story, she begins to talk about this guy that she's engaged to that she just happened to have met that day. Have you ever seen this happen before? And it all got started not with talking about that, but because he simply wanted to know, Kristoff wanted to know, how did you get yourself in this situation and what happened to your sister, the queen, and how did all this take place? And as she begins to tell this story that begins with her falling in love with a guy in one day, he gets so stuck on it, he can't hear anything else she has to say. Have you seen this before? 
And this is kind of how it goes for us, is that now we can get so fixated on something that's been said that we miss out on all that follows. And I want to take a look at that today because I think this has a very powerful influence in our lives. We stop listening too soon, too often, and we miss out on the most important part. And we're going to begin in John chapter 13 with this idea of why is it that we can have a good response in mind and yet miss the mark, which by the way is also a way that we define sin. That we can have this good response in mind and yet it leads us into something that's actually sin. It misses the mark completely. Why does this happen? And maybe it is because we stop listening too soon and we miss the most important part. John, in his writings here, we find, we don't know if exactly if it was John, there's lots of arguing about who wrote what, and we're not going to try to settle any of that here. I'm just going to refer to John as the author since it's named the Gospel of John. But John begins to write in a way that brings in a lot of imagery throughout. He has this huge contrast that takes place throughout the gospel writings. There seems to be these complete opposites. Either you're in or you're out. Either you're right or you're wrong. Either you're a follower of Jesus or you're not. Either you have faith or you don't have faith. Either you're all about this or you're all against this. Either you're about the kingdom of God or you're all about the world. He sets up quite a dichotomy that runs throughout that you can see reflected in some of the things said here in these last chapters over the upcoming weeks. But I also want to make sure you understand that the reason John, the Gospel of John, is probably written in the first place was there are several, of course, telling the story of Jesus, the Savior, the risen Savior who's come to bring life for all, but also it's a later writing of the Gospels. In fact, we're pretty confident out of the four Gospels in the New Testament, it's the latest writing that takes place. And so you've had more time since the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus where things have come up, where they have been uh, definitely a lot of violent actions against this new movement. And also you had this time when the fighting has begun among the people, different sects of the people within this new faith are fighting with each other. And a lot of people look at this and read and argue that a lot of the writing in the Gospel of John is to resolve this painful division that has taken place in the early church. And so there's this constant call, as we'll see, this call to love one another over and over again, and this call to maintain unity as he'll begin to pray. In fact, I want to read you a quote from John chapter 17, beginning in verse 20, when Jesus begins to say this prayer that's written out the whole chapter 17 in the Gospel of John. Jesus says, My prayer is not for them, his close friends, his disciples alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I and in you may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And you can see this call to unity and speaking not just to the 12 disciples and whoever else happened to be in the room that evening, but now speaking directly to all those who have come to faith because of what began with the ministry of the apostles after Jesus' death and resurrection. So you can see even this aim by the author here at the people of that time, and I think speaking very clearly to us, goes on in verse 22 to say, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them, and you and me, so that they might be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. And those are powerful words that really set the stage for what we're going to look at here in John chapter 13 to get this series started on this first Sunday in Lent. This begins differently in the Gospel of John, this time what we call often the Last Supper before Jesus is arrested than in the other three Gospels. In fact, at no point do they actually have Jesus sit down and break bread and pass you know, the wine around where we get this idea of communion from still today. Instead, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. This is a big moment, and maybe you are pretty aware of that. And Peter immediately begins to have a problem with this. But the crazy thing is that Peter's problem with the washing the feet is only found in the Gospel of John, because that's the only place we read about Jesus washing feet. But the idea of Peter being upset and Peter making claims, this story shows up in all four Gospels that we're going to read 
today. And so here's how it goes. In John chapter 13, beginning in verse 33, we read, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I'm going, you cannot come. And here's the deal. As he's sitting around talking to his friends, and he makes this claim that, uh, hey, where I'm going, you cannot come. Immediately, it seems like Peter just shuts off his ability to hear, kind of like how it goes for us sometimes, as we talked about just a minute ago, right? The conversation is taking place. Someone says something, grabs our attention. We can't pay attention to anything else they're saying. We have a Kristoff problem. And here comes Peter having what is going to be known here pretty soon as a big problem just like that. At this point, it's like Peter cuts off his ability to hear anything else. All he hears now is, where I'm going, you cannot come. And Peter's going, oh, that can't be true. And here's the craziest part. Listen to what Jesus says next that Peter, as we'll find out here in just a minute, completely misses. Verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. And you're going, wait a minute, that is not a new command at all. Jesus, come on, that command has been around. We've read about in the first three Gospels before we ever got to the Gospel of John. That was said in all the other Gospels way before this Last Supper time, before you're arrested. What are you talking about, this new command? We all know that one, to love one another. In fact, I think it went with that first one that said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It kind of came out. Well, listen to what Jesus follows it up with here in the Gospel of John. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And suddenly, it's not just to love one another however we understand love, but to love one another the same way Jesus has shown love to us. Life laid down for the other. It's a pretty big statement. In fact, as you begin to look at it and think about it, these defining aspects of being a follower of Jesus are made pretty pretty clear for us here. And everyone knows that you're a follower of Jesus by living and loving like Jesus. And in a time when there's so much fight going on within the church, this is a very powerful statement. These painful divisions often bring a loss of love or understanding of what it means to love one another, does it not? We still experience this today, the divisions that we are experiencing in our lives. And the deal is in this Johannine literature, this greatest commandment that we hear in the other three Gospels never shows up beforehand, and it comes only in this way for us in the Gospel of John. In fact, Jesus is going to say it two more times in John chapter 15. But if you read the whole Johannine literature and go to 1 John, you find this very big statement. Where instead of just saying, hey, the first commandment is to love God, and the second commandment is to love your neighbor, and they're very important, which is a great call of the other three Gospels. But in the Gospel of John, and throughout the Johannine literature, they are brought completely together. In fact, if you read in 1 John chapter 4, Jesus says, here's the deal. You say you love God, but if you don't love one another, you really don't love God. You can't love God and not love one another. And this is a big claim, is it not? And this is what we find In the Johannine literature, we find Jesus mentioning it now for the first time as he's speaking with the disciples before he's arrested. Verse 36 picks up again. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? And obviously, as I said earlier, Peter had gotten distracted. Jesus just gives this big command to love as Jesus has loved them. And instead of talking anything about, well, what does that mean for me to love as you have loved us, Jesus? Can you kind of give us some examples? Peter goes right back to the beginning of where this all started, right? Lord, let's go back to where you were. Where are you going that I can't come? And here's how Jesus responds. Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And this is kind of like that short answer. And in some ways, I feel like it's kind of to appease Peter and say, hey, here's what I said. Like, you you can't go where I'm going now, but here's the deal. Don't worry. I'll I'll give you a little more info. You, You can follow later, just not right now, but Peter is just stuck on it, and he can't stop, and he asks, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And here comes the claim, right? Peter's gotten stuck in that moment of what was said in the beginning. He's unable to hear this big, I would like to say one of the most important parts, what we call the greatest commandment in other settings, right, 
of what Jesus had to say because he's distracted and caught off guard and stuck in those first words that Jesus said. And now he makes this claim. It's the very claim that actually shows up again later in John chapter 15, verse 12 and 13. My command is this, Jesus says, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And this is like a precursor to it. And Peter like warms it up for Jesus to be able to say later, does he not? Because here Peter goes, no, no, here's the deal, Jesus. I will do anything to follow you. Nothing can stop me. In fact, I'd even lay down my life for you. Quite a claim of great faith especially from someone who's been so stuck on just that first part of what Jesus had to say and has completely missed out on that big part that he had to follow about loving others as Jesus has and following that example. And here's how Jesus responds. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And you've probably heard that before, haven't you? And Peter's obviously crushed by this. And as you read through this text, as we begin to think about what has happened right here, Jesus explains in verse 35 that people will know we follow him by our love. You know, the world is changed as we find a way to continue to love one another. This is the big call that Jesus has put on his disciples. And as we find in the gospel of John, something that's spoken out to all followers of Jesus for all, all the years to come. You see, this isn't the broken mistake for love that comes so common in our world today. This isn't a love that's reflected too often times in the movies we watch and in the books we read. This is truly, as Peter claimed he would do and as Jesus really did, life laid down for others. Which brings us to this question that I want to ask. Why did Peter respond to Jesus' words in this way? Why did did Peter really get fixated on that first part and miss that whole second part of what Jesus had to say? Why did Peter go on actually later in the story and to draw a sword after Jesus has told them what he's doing and chop off the ear of one of the servants who come with the men to arrest Jesus, which is in no way what Jesus has called them to do, and once again shows that Peter hasn't been able to hear and to really listen to what Jesus has been teaching. Why is it that we can have a good response in mind and yet miss the mark? How can we have good intentions in mind and yet miss the mark? We stop listening too soon and we miss the most important part. Just like Peter. We're guilty of this as well, are we not? We stop listening too soon. And miss the most important part. Now, I've heard it said, you know, you got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. And I think that's true. And I'm a big fan of it. And I love the song. But that doesn't mean at any point that we stop listening. You see, we read a story where we are called to love like Jesus. But Peter stopped listening and he missed it question for us. I want you to think about this week. Where have you stopped listening? As we read the story, this greatest commandment, as we understand it, these words spoken by Jesus that were so important as begins this conversation with them on that night and of his last day alive before he's crucified. And he says to them during this time, this great call to love as he has loved others. And yet Peter missed it because he got stuck on this one point. Have you gotten stuck on that one point somewhere in life? And have you missed the big story? Where have you stopped listening? I encourage you to take this week 
throughout the series of me trying to give some big conclusive statement on how you're supposed to get everything right, I want to see if maybe we can just ask a question that gives us a chance to look at life through that question for a week. And so for you, as we hear from Peter in this story, where have you stopped listening? Let's pray. God, open our ears to hear and fill our hearts with love to respond the way you've called us to lay down our lives for our friends, to reflect the life Jesus lived that brought life for us. God, help us to so move in faith that we see the change in this world that you came to bring, the changes that we've already seen made possible through your Son, and the hope that we have for so much even better to come because of who you are and the work you're doing in us and through us. God, thank you for this season, this time of preparation, for the great gift and the amazing move on your part to bring us life that we prepare our hearts to celebrate. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As we finish up with worship here this morning, I just want to remind you of a couple of things going on here at the church. We had a great Ash Wednesday service, and we look forward to being able to meet uh, here at the church over these weeks throughout the season of Lent, preparing our hearts for the big celebration on Easter. On Easter Sunday, we plan to have uh, three services just like we do each week. Um, we are actually considering moving our 11 o'clock service back outside, weather permitting is the plan. So um, if you love the outside worship Easter Sunday, if we have some beautiful weather, we plan to be outside at the 11 o'clock service. So it'll be 8.30 uh, in the fellowship hall. That'll be 9.30 in the sanctuary and 11 o'clock outside weather permitting. If weather doesn't permit, we'll be back uh, inside for it. But um, that's kind of the Easter plan. I just want to make sure you're aware of it. We've had uh, some people signing up and joining up with Bible studies and ways to connect. So glad to see that. If you're still interested, let us know um, as everything's rolling. Um, we've got another group getting ready to start here in the upcoming weeks as well. So we'd love for you to be a part of it if that's something you're interested in. Also, take a moment if you can to give. You can give online. Go to our website at midlandumc.com slash give, or you can uh, text in to 706-222-1014. That's 706-222-1014. You can text to give. Um, this morning, we just are so grateful for the opportunity to do the ministry we do here, and we know that one of the main reasons it's possible is for the generosity of all those who are part of the ministry. So thank you for which you've already given, please take time this uh, week again to uh, give and to help make the ministry continue to happen here as we prepare for the big celebration on Easter Sunday. Go forth in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and communion with the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. See you next time.